Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Jonathan Haidt is the Cooley Professor of Ethical Leadership based in the Business and Society Program at New York University, a social psychologist whose research examines the intuitive foundations of morality. He's co-author of The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure, as well as author of the New York Times bestseller, The Righteous Mind, why good people are divided by politics and religion. He studies the origins of the human moral sense and their relevance to polarization and dysfunction, American politics, intellectual life, and our everyday lives and debates. Before coming to NYU, Professor Haidt taught for 16 years at UVA, University of Virginia. Welcome, I'm glad we're finally doing this. Me too, great to be here, Alexander. Congratulations on both books. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start with that last biographical detail, UVA, mm -hmm. because the way that our moral vision as Americans has evolved in recent years in some ways relates to Charlottesville, um, the domestic terrorist incident there, and the normalizing, the legitimizing of um, a terrorist organization, the KKK, in a modern incarnation. Um, and I wanted to start there because we have an old adage that was the influence for naming our program. Keep an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. Mm -hmm. And that is the essence of what we have to do here each week. Because we don't want to tolerate on the open mind totalitarianism, racism, bigotry. That's not part of a spectrum of ideas that we want to give credence to. Mm -hmm. What say you about the events in Charlottesville and how it relates to our ability to not coddle mm -hmm. our minds and to preserve righteous minds? Mm -hmm. Great question. First, <clears throat> first, let me make a philosophical point, which is um, many people seem to think that either there are facts or there are just subjective opinions and there's nothing in between. And that if you, uh, if you grant that there's more than one right way, more than one truth, well then you must be a relativist. You must be someone who believes there's no moral truth. Um, what I've become uh, philosophically is a pluralist. Uh, I learned this from my, my mentor uh, uh, at the University of Chicago where I did a postdoc, Richard Schwader, who is an a brilliant anthropologist who taught me that each culture is expert in some things, but they can't see everything. And so the only way I think we can deal with diversity in our modern lives is to be pluralists, which means there is more than one right way, but that doesn't mean anything goes and, hey, a bunch of guys in pointy hats want to march around and burn crosses. Well, that's what they want to do. You know, So I'm not a relativist. There, it, there are things that are right and wrong, but there's often more than one. Okay, next point, UVA. It just, it's so sad that my, this, this school that I love, this school that has such, uh, uh, such, uh, uh, elicit such passion in its students, is now associated in the world's minds with Nazis. And this was, um, this was Thomas Jefferson's beloved university. Um, it was a tragedy, what happened there? Uh, it was uh, picked on because uh, I think one of the guys who organized the rally had gotten a degree there and he was from the area. Um, I would not say that, uh, that the events normalized the Klan in any way. Um, what we are witnessing is the breakup of any sort of public, um, uh, public shared space into multiple, multiple sub-worlds. And yes, there is a larger world than we realized. 
in which Nazis and the Klan are fighting for goodness or righteousness. Um, but I think the United States still strongly rejects that. I don't think they've been normalized. The idea, though, Professor, that there was any pluralism among those very fine people, not very fine people, right? So there isn't a pluralism, an acceptance that we want to tolerate viewpoints within a modern day clan. Um, but my point to you, I don't want to associate those events with the institution of UVA whatsoever. What I want to do is associate them with the decision of a governor or a mayor to grant a permit to a domestic terrorist mm -hmm. organization. Yes. Uh, well, the First Amendment uh, grants wide rights to association. I, I can't weigh in on whether, whether the mayor or police chief, whoever it was who granted the, the rights, um, whether, they, whether there were grounds for blocking them entirely. I used to live for, uh, for um, my first eight years in Charlottesville, I lived three blocks east of where those protests were, and that space was way too small for a giant protest. Had it been shunted off, you know, out of the center of town, things might have been not so ugly at least. Um, so, but I would just want to make the point that it's very difficult to do any good thinking when there are Nazis on the table. If we're going to try to derive principles here from a discussion of Nazis and the Klan marching in Charlottesville, we're not going to do a very good job of it. Why is that? Why, why are we Be because poised to eliminate a subset of constituents? Um, because our minds are, are intuitive and emotional. We are capable of, we are capable of making fine distinctions. We are capable of weighing, weighing things when we're not thinking about Nazis or, or nuclear war or But are you saying sex. that because we have the capacity to have distance from those events and therefore we shouldn't be informed by a philosophy of Francisco Franco or Adolf Hitler? And uh, because there was a moment <clears throat> when our moral worldview, the definition of, of righteousness would be informed by service in World War II. Mm -hmm. Combating fascism. We, we shouldn't think about it that way anymore? Oh, no, no. So I see what you're saying. I believe we are now in a condition that we could call Babel, uh, in which there is no overarching moral framework. There was a wonderful overarching framework in the United States for much of the 20th century, and it, it had problems all along, but we kept improving it. And now it seems to have broken up. Um, so much is happening that was just inconceivable before. Uh, the only point I was trying to make is that I thought you were going to uh -huh. say there can be no doubt, no other side on the events in Charlottesville. And since the Nazis are on one side with the Klan, it seems like, yes, we have to agree, there can be no other side. And certainly about the Nazis and the Klan, yeah, I'm not going to say that they're in any way morally legitimate. Um, I just mean that if you look at the way the, that half the country is interpreting those events, now, I'm, I'm a centrist, and I get lots of emails from friends on both sides trying to convince me that I need to side with them against those sure. monsters on the other side. So the way a lot of the country is seeing the events is this was about what to do about statues. And on that, there should be, there are two sides. That's something that we should at least talk about. But once Nazis come into it, there is no other side. Now, I'm fine with that in this case. I think the right thing to do, you know, we all learned about these, what these, the history of these statues, that they were not put up right after the Civil War, that they were put up in a period when white supremacist laws were being, so I'm not defending the statues. We reunited and that Confederate blood retained its, its place in our history after the Civil War, in the aftermath of those events, and therefore we are a union that is composed partially of disunion? Yes. That's all true. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. I was talking I more about amnesia and whether amnesia in our psyche, the lack of historical knowledge and moral frames that are more definitive, is connected to this babble, this idea of babble oh, that see. you're talking I about. See. It's thinking about how we think about history. History is always contested and always will be and always should be. Uh, I didn't fully understand the history of those statues, even though I lived near them. I didn't understand it until we went through the events in Charlottesville. And I didn't understand the larger history uh, until I visited um, uh, Montgomery, Alabama a couple of months ago on a civil rights uh, pilgrimage with the Faith and Politics Institute. And to learn from Brian Stevenson how racism in this country, how slavery didn't exactly end in 1865, how it changed form and how it keeps changing form. Um, so I, I think in the long run, even though what happened was horrible in Charlottesville, 
um, I think there is a sense in which we were fixing a historical error that had been made in memory, and we were cleaning some things up. Um, so maybe there is some hope here. Maybe there is some progress. Do you find that the amnesia, the lack of historical knowledge, influences the, the babble in, in the way we might view a subject like Russia's interference in our election? Because I want yes. to get to this subject of polarization yes. and the, the contributing factors to polarization and dysfunction on which you're an expert. Yes. This is something I'm very, very concerned about, um, the lack of historical knowledge. And if you think about, you know, when you and I were growing up, if you think about how much of the, of the, of the information that came into our minds, how much of the things we watched on TV were created more than 20 years ago, uh, to what extent were we connected to the world of our parents and grandparents? We had some sense of what World War II was about. I, I have a sense of a connection to almost the whole 20th century through my parents and grandparents. Um, and if you look at y young people now, because of the change in the media environment, they're much more cut off from anything that happened before because they're so much more connected to each other. And so even to have forgotten uh, much of the history of the Soviet Union and the Iron Curtain, I think makes it very difficult to think about economic questions, to think about historical questions, to see signs of authoritarianism and fascism and, and even communism rearing their heads in the 21st century. We thought these vampires were all dead. And so, yes, I'm very alarmed that young people uh, um, are not, don't have a connection, as much of a connection to history as I believe used to be the case. And to think of the Cold War, what we're experiencing today, as an analog to that for digital cyber espionage. There's an interesting difference between the, the, the sort of the new Cold War that's happening now and the old one. The old one was really run by um, engineers and scientists and physicists who were trying to think of better ways to physically kill the other side. And what's going on now uh, is that the change in technology and information structure has turned each of us into the potential weapons. And this is what we found out in the Russian hacking scandal. Um, the reason why the Russians were so effective, it turns out, was not the bots. There was a big study done uh, by Deb Roy's lab at MIT uh, in which they traced out all the false information stories on Twitter over many years. And what they found is that while bots contributed, it turns out we were the bots. You did, the Russians didn't need any bots. All they had to do was put out some article, and, and some of them were even true, some article that would trigger outrage on one side. Well, they, now, they modeled the outrage, and then they said, you go do this. I mean, then they say, the American people, you know, it's like, America, are you listening, right? Hack the other political opponent's psyche. Maybe that they were in some sense modeling process, but I think what's been going on since the rise of Twitter and other forms uh, is that um, because the, the incentive structure of social media is that I'm not actually communicating with you. I'm just using you as, a, as, a, as an excuse for me to show off how much I model certain virtues or what a good member I am of my team. And so the more savage and cruel I can be to you in a clever way, the more credit I get. So this was all happening before the Russians. Um, and I think it's almost as though, uh, you know, as, as cross-partisan hatred has been rising and rising since the 80s, but especially after the year 2000. Uh, I've got many graphs of it from different data sources. It sort of rises gently. And then after 2000, it accelerates. Most of our cross-partisan hatred, uh, the increase was since around 2002, 2004. And um, as that was rising, what that does to us is we will now believe almost anything, no matter how outrageous, anything that makes the other side look bad, we will believe. And so I see the role of the Russians mostly just as just feeding more stuff in, as though we like pulled open our head and said, yeah, if you want to manipulate me, just stick the screwdriver here and turn and I'll, I'll go. You have studied and identified um, the moral frame through which a conservative may view an issue versus a, a liberal. Uh, how, how is that informing the way we view what is righteous mm -hmm. um, and, and what we view as uh, whatever the opposite of coddled is? Um, because we want to be as, aspiring for righteousness and aspiring for strength. Strength. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So first, I guess I should say uh, what it is that I do. You and I have talked about uh, some pretty controversial things. And I'm afraid I violated my major dictum here, um, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, speak, to the, speak to the elephant first. Let me just explain that. Sure. So my own research is on moral psychology and on moral intuition. 
And I was just really struck in graduate school um, in psychology uh, at the way that moral discussion, moral argument is not really based on reasons. Uh, people sort of throw reasons at each other and we're not open to the other person's reasons. We, we start with a gut feeling and then we just justify that. And um, the, the analogy I used in my first book, The Happiness Hypothesis, is that the mind is divided into parts like a rider on an elephant. The, the elephant is this gigantic thing which is all of our ancient intuitions and emotions and social influences. And the rider is this little guy on top that doesn't have much influence. That's conscious reasoning. And in our moral lives, like right now, we're engaging in conscious reasoning and we're kind of working hard at it. Um, but typically, our moral reasoning is driven by our passions and emotions. It's as though that the elephant sort of knows where he wants to go, says, okay, we're going there. And then the rider just comes up with justifications or reasons. Sure. And so I speak to a lot of groups that are interested in how to reduce polarization. I, pretty much every group I speak to, it seems you've had them on, on this show. Um, and one of the things I always tell them is you have to speak to the elephant first. You have to uh, put people at ease, uh, don't alienate them, acknowledge their core concerns. So I fear that by talking about Nazis uh, with you first, I may have lost a lot of your viewers right away, but let's see if we can win them back. Well, let's win them back by thinking of Mike Pence and Pete Buttigieg, right? That's, okay. I think, a way to understand your original <clears throat> hypothesis and its development. Um, there are two definitions of righteousness, and Mayor Pete is doing something phenomenal that yeah. Democrats have failed to do, yeah. uh, which is unearth the origin of that moral feeling, the elephant, That's not, right. and be the That's right. embodiment of the rider. So our minds can play lots of different games, and war is one of them. We're very good at war. We evolved to be tribal creatures. Uh, we're very good at doing us versus them, and our politics has devolved more and more into that. Um, but one of my main points in The Righteous Mind was that our politics at the national level is also kind of like religion. That is, the, in America in particular, our country is not based on blood or soil. It's not based on ancestry or race. It's based on, uh, on a creed, uh, on accepting the American creed. Uh, and then it's open to anyone who more or less accepts those. And By that creed, the fundamental assertions in the Declaration and Constitution. That's right. The Declaration and the Preamble of the Constitution. Right. Um, uh, and As understood through our modern constitutional law. Yes, the way we think about it now is much more about diversity and openness than right. it was in the 18th century. Just wanted century. to get those definitions yeah. out. So it, it changes over time. Right. Um, but my point is that in the United States in particular, it's been said, uh, Robert Bellow, the sociologist, I think coined the term, that we have what he called the American civil religion. And in the United States, we have these holy books, the founding documents. Uh, we have these wise men. We have these rituals. Uh, and, and we think of democracy in kind of sacred terms. You know, we fought wars to defend democracy. Uh, and so there is an element in which we want our politics to be uplifting. We want the president to be the high priest, especially in times of crisis. And this is something where both George W. Bush and Obama were, were, rose to occasions um, uh, and where obviously Donald Trump has not. Uh, with each crisis, each time we need that high priest, it seems to all be about him. Uh, so back to Pete Buttigieg. And my Mike God, Pence. the man is beautiful. I mean, the way he <laughs> speaks, he touches, he touches this part of us that is hungry, that has not been touched in a long time. It's been said that he is the antithesis of, of Pence uh, and Trump, but Trump in the lack of virtue. Uh, Pence in, in his culpability in um, degrading virtue. Um, but they're, they're Hoosiers, they're both from Indiana. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually have a kind of similar presentation um, Pete will delve more into the nuances uh, of an ar a given articulation and intellectual mm -hmm. honesty, but that's what he's, he's getting at, which is yeah. the belief that he, um, as a uh, gay 37-year-old uh, mayor of South Bend, um, has every right to a conviction in, in faith, in um, the Bible, in uh, American heritage, and so he's expanding the view of what might be um, that um, gut moral concentration. That's right. That's right. And it's a beautiful thing to see. For a long time, American politics has been polarizing on some very familiar dimensions. Uh, in the 1970s, I think it was the case that if you knew how often someone went to church, you didn't know which party they voted for. Uh, but beginning, I forget when it really kicked in, but certainly by, the, by, the, by 2000, it was very much the case that if you went to church regularly or synagogue, 
you were on the right, and if you didn't, you were on the left. Uh, and so we were having this split, which was turning into a personality split as well. And that's part of why our politics now is so much more savage than before. If you have political parties that are coalitions of interests, well, you can actually kind of compromise. But when they're coalitions of personality types with shared moral values, then the people on the other side are so different and their values are so alien that they're the enemy. So it's moving that way for a long time. And then you get someone like Mayor Pete, who is a Christian and speaks in ways that are that, that, that sound religious. Um, and, I have, and, and on the right, you have Donald Trump acting in ways that I cannot connect to conservatism. So how do you understand the tolerance of the evangelical? Is it all as the conventional wisdom says, Roe v. Wade? How do you explain Franklin Graham and his associates who are going to every last measure to defend this man? Is it all Roe v. Wade um, that allows them to discount every other instinct that they might have looking at his words in the way that he behaves? So um, we, we have a two-party system and people are endlessly able to justify what it is they want. Um, and so as I've watched, I've, I'm so disappointed in, uh, in principled conservatives and evangelicals uh, who have swung behind Trump and been willing to uh, forgive or overlook many things that you would think that conservatives and, and Christians would be horribly offended by. Um, I don't know that it, it, it is entirely strategic in their minds. I think that we can come to believe almost whatever we want. And you have to remember that our politics now is best described not as who we favor, but as what we're against. Political scientists call this negative partisanship. We're mostly voting against the other side, not for our side. And so people on the right and conservatives of all types um, can certainly find a lot of things they hate about the left, and that can be enough for them to find reasons to just hold their nose or overlook uh, uh, um, actions that are clearly not conservative. I don't want to give you the $800 trillion question to close, but I fear that I have to, which is how you reverse course. I think it's going to be extremely difficult. There are about 10 major causes, 10 historical or sociological causes that are driving us towards greater polarization because the late 20th century was an anomaly of really, really low polarization up through the, the post-war years up until about the, the 1980s. Um, and so with the media environment pushing us into a more fractionated space, with the loss of the greatest generation, with the loss of a common enemy, there are a lot of trends working in the wrong direction. I think what we need to do, um, because I, I love this country, I love liberal democracy, and I'm really frightened. I'm really frightened that the trends may be insurmountable. Uh, and so we all need to really take this seriously and give it a try. Uh, and things like your show are part of the solution. We need to think of it this way. First, there are structural and systemic factors that we have to change. As long as people don't trust the system, they'll believe conspiracy theories, they won't see the, the other side as legitimate. So we've got to change a lot about the way we run our elections, uh, find alternatives to closed party primaries, get more money out of politics. Um, uh, people have to have a lot of faith. We have to uh, increase voter turnout. We're never gonna go to mandatory voting the way they do in Australia. That would bring a lot of people in from the center. But we have to get voter turnout up and make it very easy and quick to vote. So there's all kinds of systemic things. Same thing with Congress. There's a lot of reforms we can make in Congress so that it isn't us versus them all the time, that there would be the ability to compromise or work together. Those are the big things that are really gonna do a lot of the heavy lifting. A lot of those are never gonna happen. So that means that it's up to the rest of us as individuals and in our groups. And Two areas I want you to cover, social media and higher ed. How are they instructive in helping us correct? So social media, I think, is the biggest single problem that we face. Um, of course, there are all these other built-in structural problems, but for anything, social media makes things worse. Uh, people are tribal. We can turn us versus them, or we can bury the hatchet and and trade and exchange. And social media is almost like being force fed a constant stream of outrage stories, including video, which is incredibly compelling to, our, to the elephant, as it were, to our internal, uh, to our deep intuitions. Um, as long as many people are on social media, I think it's gonna be very difficult to, to reverse the polarization. Um, I saw a tweet the other day, if you could go back in time and kill baby Twitter, would you do it? And I think the answer is yes, I sure would. Um, each of us as individuals, I think, should try to spend less time on these platforms 
be more positive and, and try to have more praise and positivity on them. Um, but it's going to be very difficult. Or, or kill the IPO. I mean, kill the monetization of fraud and misinformation and disinformation. With social media, it, it, had there been a different business model, it, it could have looked right. different. So I do think that the business model is fundamentally flawed. We're not the customers, we're the product, and the more outrage there is on the platform, the more the product comes to feed. So I think, I'm, I'm hoping that there will be some severe regulation on social media. The problem isn't the internet, the internet is wonderful, but social media has very, very different properties, both on our democracy and on the mental health of young people. Must we establish, like you just did, that there has to be a consensus about the severity of the social media problem? I mean, there's certain things where we do need consensus, and higher ed can be helpful in producing a generation that's going to act on that consensus. Yes. We have to look at what is the purpose of any institution. And in some, if it's the military, you need cohesion. But if it's a university, you must have dissent. The enemy of, uh, of our mission in the university is orthodoxy. That's the biggest threat we face to doing our, our job. We can't find truth. We can't teach effectively if we're afraid to question. But it also shouldn't be frowned upon to have an organizing truth function. To the, you, it is helpful for any institution to have certain sacred values that are relative, relevant to the mission of the university. For us in universities, it has to be truth. That has to be what we hold sacred. Right, and I think that that's why you have a really important demographic that can take the leadership in acting on that truth. Um, who is this? Who are you talking about? Millennials, post-millennials now who are enrolled in higher ed and grade school and elementary school. That's Gen Z you're talking about. Gen Z. The post-millennial demographic yeah. is going to have to be critical to establishing a consensus on the problems associated with social media and the ne necessity of taking action. And, that's, yeah. and, and I'm in agreement with you about confirmation bias and the importance of diversity of, of viewpoint, a, a, a pluralistic attitude towards different solutions, but you got to identify the problems too, right? Mm -hmm. Gen Z uh, is very aware of the problems. Um, I speak about my, my, my recent book, The Coddling of the American Mind, written with Greg Lukianoff. I speak about it all over the country. I give a portrait of what social media is doing to Gen Z. I ask them, do you agree? And they almost all say yes. They know it's a problem. As for whether they'll be able to do something about it, that's less clear. They do say that they are, it makes, social media makes them much more reluctant to step out of line. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for your time today. My pleasure, Alexander. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.